It is my great joy and delight to welcome you this evening. My name is Robin Steinke, and I serve as the president at Luther Seminary. At least I have been for about the last hour and a half. <laughs> I've been here since the first of June, and one of the great joys and gifts of these early days is getting to know some of our faculty who have a long treasured history in this place. And we are here this evening for the inaugural lectureship of the Terence and Faith Fretheim lectureship. And I want to share with you a few words at the beginning of the document which made this night possible and tomorrow as well. Because I think in these opening words of this document that opened and made this lectureship possible, you get a glimpse of the character and the wisdom and strength and commitment of Terry and Faith and their vision for theological education for the sake of the world that made this possible. I want to share this with you. They write, in thanksgiving for God's gift of life, family, work, and other blessings that sustain us, and in thanksgiving for God's gifts of church and seminary, where we have shared faith and life in community, and in thanksgiving to God for calling us to be teachers and educators, we respond in gratitude to God for these gifts by establishing the Terence E. and Faith L. Lectureship Fund at Luther Seminary. And they further describe the purpose of this legacy. This lectureship is established to provide the seminary community and related constituencies and it is so wonderful to see so many related constituencies here tonight. It is to provide these related constituencies in the community with access to biblical theological scholarship by prominent theologians from the USA or abroad. And listen carefully to this part. The God of the Bible shall regularly be a focus for these presentations with a special concern for ways in which the theological dimensions of biblical texts can continue to speak to Christian communities. If you've read the newspaper or listened to the news today, I can think of no other time when this world has needed more the wisdom of the ways that biblical texts can continue to speak in our time. So this is the inaugural lectureship. So Terry and Faith, on behalf of this seminary community, thank you for your vision, for your wisdom, for your commitment. Will you join with me in thanking Terry and Faith for this? Please Reverend Dr. Katherine Schifferdecker, and she will introduce our speaker for this evening. It is my great honor to introduce our inaugural Fretheim lecturer, Dr. Walter Brueggemann, and I'll be brief, I promise. Uh, before I do so, I want to draw your attention to a few events taking place tomorrow morning in your uh, program here. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9.15, uh, Dr. Brueggemann will be talking on preaching the Old Testament right here in this chapel again, uh, particularly for those who preach, but all are welcome to come to that. Then we have the great honor of having uh, Terry Fretheim preach.
preach at our uh, daily chapel service at 11 a.m. again in this chapel, and right afterwards, uh, Dr. Brueggemann and Dr. Fretheim will have a, a public conversation up here, uh, and uh, uh, we'll take questions and comments from uh, those attending. So we look forward to all of those events, and you are welcome to uh, any or all of those. You're also welcome to stay uh, after this lecture for a reception in the North X. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our inaugural Fretheim lecturer in biblical theology, Dr. Walter Brueggemann, the author of many, many books and articles in biblical theology and Old Testament studies. Dr. Brueggemann is a gift to the academy and to the church. His writing is both academic and accessible, and his work is itself a strong argument for why the Old Testament must not go away. For in his study of the Old Testament text, Dr. Brueggemann has helped us think deeply about who God is and who God calls us to be. It is particularly appropriate that Dr. Brueggemann should be the first Fretheim lecturer in biblical theology because Terry and Walter have been friends for many years now. They challenge each other's work, they appreciate each other's work, and they share a deep and lifelong commitment to doing biblical theology for the sake of the church and of the world. Please join me in welcoming our inaugural Fretheim Lecturer in Biblical Theology, Dr. Walter Brueggemann. I cannot imagine a greater privilege or a greater delight than to be invited to give the inaugural lecture in this new series of Terence E. and Faith L. Fretheim Lectures. It is a privilege to be invited back to what is likely the best of all of our seminaries to salute Terry, surely among the most important and influential of all of its faculty members over a long history. It is a delight to have a chance to celebrate Faith and Terry for long partnership and a long friendship. This is an occasion to celebrate Faith's long ministry in the national offices of the ALCA. It is an occasion at his retirement to celebrate Terry as perhaps the most consistently generative Old Testament interpreter of our generation. My meeting up with Faith and Terry over time was most regularly at the Fortress Press reception at SBL. <laughs> where we gladly indulged in free Lutheran wine and food. <laughs> Beyond that, Terry and I have crossed paths in countless ways with just enough distance in between our perspectives to keep the conversation going, but always a conversation that has been gracious on his part and endlessly rich and suggestive for my own work. My debts are very great to him, and I have no doubt that this lectureship in their honor will mature to become one of the great lectureships in our common work, given that the seminary will be a vigilant and supportive custodian of that trust. Because I consider this lectureship a quite personal invitation and a quite personal privilege, I take the liberty of reflecting on the common work in which Terry and I have long been engaged. Both of us came to graduate study and teaching at the rise of what came to be called polemically the biblical theology movement in the wake of Gerhard von Rod and George Ernest Wright. There was at the time a tsunami of new energy for the work that eventually led our discipline away from narrow historical criticism, a move that was already in court in the work of von Rod. While there was a large number of significant scholars of our generation, Terry and I have outlasted most of them in our work. <laughs> and I expect Terry's work to continue for a long time yet to come. The end of a salary check does not necessarily entail the end of his generative juices, so we may expect more. When Terry and I entered the field, it was very much a common practice of theological seminaries to raise up their own new faculty members from among their own students, dispatching them to graduate school and soon after inviting them back. This was true for both of us. Beyond that, Terry and I have in common that we are both PKs 
from Midwestern churches of the Reformation traditions, and both have served on faculties of our seminary alma maters, he longer than I. That rootage in home and seminary has assured that for all of our critical interest and responsibility, we mostly would spend our energy doing interpretive work in the service of the church, surely finding that task both more interesting and more important than the critical enterprise of the guild. The difference and distance between us is of two varieties. First, it matters, of course, that Terry was nurtured in and continues in the interpretive trajectory of Luther's theology and its defining accent on God's graciousness. This is reflected not only in his theological exposition, but in his own ironic presence in the seminary and in the guild, the latter which is quite short on ironic spirit. <laughs> Conversely, my rootage is primarily in the tradition of Calvin, though my antecedents in the Prussian Union included a strong accent from Luther as well. These antecedents in my tradition were determined to maintain a unionist link between Luther and Calvin, so that my education was a mix of Luther and Calvin, albeit soft Luther and soft Calvin. <laughs> the second difference and dif distance between us is our hermeneutical stances. Since his earliest writing, Terry has opted for a hermeneutic that has the scope of creation, or what he called in his early book, The Suffering of God, an organismic paradigm in which the will and purpose of God are embedded in the life processes of creation. Conversely, my own hermeneutical stance has turned out to be a liberationist perspective in which God is voiced as a nameable, identifiable agent who acts in freedom, not only in, with, and under creation, but over against creation for the sake of emancipation. It is not clear to me that this confessional difference between Luther and Calvin and this hermeneutical difference between uh, creation hermeneutic and liberation hermeneutic are deeply related to each other, but Terry suspects that they are, and if Terry thinks so, so do I. <laughs> because the tradition of Luther is all about God's grace, it follows for Terry that the whole of creation, as God's creation, is a theater occupied by God's resolve for graciousness. Conversely, there is no doubt that the tradition of Calvin is the foremost among Reformation traditions in its commitment to public justice and so to liberation as is reflected in Barth and Moltmann and a number of third world Calvinists. While the tradition of Luther is not indifferent to matters of social justice and liberation, the tradition of Calvin goes much further with that accent. And the tradition of Calvin is not indifferent to the way in which all of creation comes back to God's grace, but the tradition of Luther goes much further. Thus, our different accents on gracious order and liberation, on creation and historical redemption, are centrally informed for Terry and for me by our rootage. But of course, Luther and Calvin have provided for Terry and me great commonalities that we share, that the world soon or late will come to serve and reflect in glad ways the intent of the Creator God who liberates. Those differences have propelled us in somewhat different interpretive directions. It is fair to say that Terry and I are on important matters are in full agreement. Most of all, we are agreed that the testimony to faith in the Old Testament is a peculiar and indispensable treasure and summons for the Church. We are commonly rooted in German pietism with its focus on the compassion of God. The Bible is a treasure because the testimony is incomparable and sui generis. It provides us a disclosure of God and God's world that is given nowhere else. That treasure is also a summons because the dialogical character of God in this testimony insists upon and expects full engagement of all the creatures most especially the Adamic creatures who have been given peculiar responsibility and peculiar freedom. In what follows, I want to consider what is peculiar in this treasure and summons of the Old Testament to which Terry and I have given our lifelong attention, in which he has been consistently my teacher. 
I have taken as my theme the question, what is it with the Old Testament? What is it that makes the Old Testament so problematic and now with a torrent of books on the violence of God in the Old Testament? What is it that makes the Old Testament the first place in the theological curriculum where faith meets criticism to the consternation of many? What is it that the church always wants to get rid of the Old Testament by a general disregard, by a willful misreading, or by a gerrymandered lectionary? (laughs) What is it that the Old Testament will not go away even when we try so hard? Or what is it that the Old Testament must not go away because there is so much at stake with it for us? And what is it that is at stake for us in the church? The answer I give to this set of questions is that it is the God who inhabits the text that generates all these problems and possibilities. So now you see I've fulfilled the mandate of the lectureship. (laughs) It is this inhabiting God who causes the Old Testament to be so problematic with all these books on violence of God in the Old Testament. It is this inhabiting God who causes seminarians to vex over faith and criticism because this God will not accommodate our explanatory categories even though we have done our JEDP best to dispel and explain things away. It is this inhabiting God who dwells there as an embarrassment to us so that we prefer some more domesticated God that causes theologians theologians of necessity to misread so that it comes out right, who creates such scandal that we cannot bear to read of this God in church, well, selectively. It is this inhabiting God who does not go away because it is this God who asserts as first and last, before you were here and after you are gone, I am and I will be. It is this inhabiting God who must not go away, who is indispensable for the church and for the life of the world, because it is this God who keeps the world and our pretensions open and penultimate, thus resisting lethal idolatries that come packaged as precious ideologies. The Old Testament is indispensable, will not go away because, and this is my thesis, because it is a peculiar witness to the elusive, irascible, multi-layered, multi-voiced holiness that can affect agency in the world. I should comment about this term inhabiting. We are faced with the intractable issue of how God and text or book or written form come together. It is an issue that finally remains undecided and beyond our articulation except that it cannot be doubted that this God comes with this writing. And this writing is no writing at all, except it is occupied with this God who is sketched as its dominant character. That strange linkage of God and writing can perhaps be understood with reference to the elusive quality of the Hebrew language, though Terry's teacher James Barr in his rationalistic way would have none of that. Or that linkage of God and writing must be understood in the categories of the 19th century history of religion as the genius of the Jews, or what we now say the Jewish capacity for imagination. But if we push further and ask about the source of such genius or imagination, we are pushed back to the God who occupies Jewish imagination. Occupy meaning to claim attention, occupy meaning invading and taking over as Jewish imagination of a theological variety is indeed occupied territory. In my theology book, I carelessly wrote, so I've been told, (laughs) that the God of Old Testament theology as such lives in with and under the rhetorical enterprise of this text and nowhere else in no other way. I'd have lived longer had I not added that last phrase. (laughs) Nowhere else and in no other way has turned out to be terribly problematic (laughs) and careless and indefensible, except I think it's true. (laughs) We have no other place or source where we get this character 
rendered in such a way that permits and requires one to say elusive, irascible, multi-layered, multi-voiced holiness that can affect agency in the world. So the key term is holiness, that irreducible otherness of God that lies beyond our explanatory categories that defies our formulations, that refuses our domestication, that bespeaks a commanding morality, but then rushes beyond morality in power or in pathos. It is remarkable that this text dares to give name and character and history to this force of holiness so that it is not an amorphous sacredness so popular with spiritual but not religious folk. We are too habituated to notice how daring it is to name holiness as creator of heaven and earth, as deliverer of Israel, as judge of nations, as redeemer of persons, and finally as father, son, and spirit. This holiness of God, this holy one of Israel, is the maddening complex subject of biblical discourse, maddeningly intransigent, because it refuses to yield its otherness so that the name cannot be uttered and the glory cannot be seen. Given that, however, this text, this God-given, Jewishly imagined text, dares to sketch out this holiness in song, oracle, narrative, knowing that many articulations are required and that no articulation can be taken as comprehensive and absolute. This holiness is endlessly elusive, never articulated, never adequately articulated, never domesticated, never captured in our formulations or our doctrines or our liturgies or our pieties or our moralities, but always concealed. We are in our best efforts very much like the Philistines who captured the ark and brought the ark with its punitive God into the temple of Dagon, but when they went to the temple early on the third day, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark and the head of Dagon and both feet were lying cut off from the threshold only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This God dwells variously in a small voice in a whirlwind in a refused temple in a pillar of cloud in a disruptive poem and we are left to wonder with Job how to find God or with Job, how to escape the endless surveillance of this God. This holiness is inescapably irascible, arbitrary, variously absent, neglectful, violent, disruptive, eruptive, provocative. It is this trickster God who dispatched lying prophets and true prophets who sound like they are lying, who makes non-negotiable laws and weeps in grief for love beyond law, who answers prophetic petitions and cancels locusts and then cancels fire, but then who will not relent a third time with the plumb line, who rants against Israel and then in aching soliloquy comes to a new sensibility that this is God and not man, the Holy One in your midst, Hosea 11. Such irreducible freedom and inexplicable dominance is so grossly beyond accountability And out of it, you cannot build an empire. You cannot certify an orthodoxy. All you can do is wait for another text (laughs) that eventually will be given, and it will contradict and correct the last disclosure, but with more texts always to be given and probed. This holiness is multilayered, permitting no harmonization. Our various mantras of J.E.D. and P. and our belated assemblage of four Gospels constitutes our acknowledgement that this testimony is beyond harmonization even in our reductionism because the occupying character is too complex and too complicated and indeed the very documentary hypothesis is built from uncertainty about God's name. What did Israel know and when did Israel know it? Because of course J.E.D. and P a 19th century hypothesis that is still powerful 
simply takes these sources as human voices so none of them need to be taken with utmost seriousness. We hold to our endless supersessionism until the testimony gets God more and more like us. Except, of course, that the text early and late defies such categories and our best categories of primitive and developed do not touch the claim and we are left with multiple witnesses to pause in awe before the next wave of revelatory concealment. This holiness is multivoiced with no defining voice in the back of the book. So we are addressed in songs of women who sing victory and deliverance and new births and sad defeats. We are addressed in utterances of wild urgency by poets who dare to say, Thus saith the Lord, and we don't know how to parse that. We are addressed in the punctilious design of priests who know down to the last mini-cubit about beauty and symmetry. We are addressed in the reverberations of the Psalms that name God in the extremity of doxology and in the depths of abandonment and neglect and betrayal. We are addressed in one-off narratives where anything can happen once. A hell back sun or bread from above or old bones come to life or a scroll sh shredded and rewritten. This cacophony of voices somehow arises from and speaks back holiness. And we catch on to some of it as we are able and we miss so much that eludes of it. But all of us, all of it refuses closure or coherence, offering a, offering a kind of disjunction to our ordinary life that we cannot master, but which we must engage. That named, characterized holiness, elusive, irascible, multilayered, multivoiced, is given as a witness, and these witnesses, because they cannot do otherwise, are compelled beyond themselves to hint of truth that they cannot withstand. What they give us is not certitude, not argument, not proposition, not even gospel, but only testimony that jolts or soothes with what they have seen and heard. It comes, moreover, with no explanatory key. We are given, as Myron Penner has suggested following Ricoeur, that testimony that is originary with no pedigree, prophetic daring that is confessional, and irony that says more and says less is all more than our interpretive skills can decode. This witness is peculiar. It is peculiar in translation, let alone in Hebrew. It is singular in its palpable detail so that we get God who is like fire and like wind and like bread whose arm is not short, whose face is hidden, whose rear end we may be permitted to see. <laughs> something bold, something defiant, something emancipatory, something threatening, something anxiety-producing, something planting and building, something weeping, something gentle, something plucking up and tearing down. Then it haunts us. So this witness eventually comes to a test that this named, characterized holiness can affect agency in the world. This is the subject of active verbs, most often given doxologically, as in Psalm 146, the Lord sets prisoners free, the Lord opens the eyes, the Lord lifts up, the Lord loves, the Lord watches, the Lord upholds. Or, as in Psalm 44, Israel can attest 
that God's agency has been dormant or negative. You have rejected and debased us. You have turned us back. You have made us like sheep for the slaughter. You have sold your people for a trifle. This claim of divine agency is exceedingly difficult. It is the place where Terry and I have had our most sustained engagement in Terry's hermeneutic things work mostly without direct divine agency. In the liberation hermeneutic, that agency is decisive, though it may be, as Enrique Dussel says, that that agency can be attributed to the poor. My sense is that Terry will not and does not want to exclude divine agency, but he wants it not so overstated in causal ways as he has shown that the text is often more subtle than that. What is at stake in such agency is the insistence that the world is not closed or an autonomous enterprise, but is subject to an active holiness. And indeed, even the most gentle of religious claims that God loves or that God forgives or that God is faithful is all about divine agency, even a soft variety. Religious progressives, among whom I tend to live, are vigilant that there should be no talk of an interventionist God. It's a great embarrassment. <laughs> but of course, such a notion of agency, of which you can never persuade progressives, is that that's the wrong assumption that the world is closed and in, this is an intrusion because the very claim of God's inordinate holiness averse from the outset that God does not intrude but treats the world as God's creature, yielding what Terry rightly calls a partnership. In any case, we face in our culture the epistemological embarrassment that this peculiar witness will not let us imagine that our world is immune from the active force of holiness whose name we know. In this testimony, that active force of holiness requires no special warrant for engagement because the shoe is on the other foot. Terry's defining book is entitled God and the World, not the world and perhaps God. <laughs> One can see the trickiness of divine agency as Terry has taught us. At the outset of the Exodus narrative, and he caught me out about this at the SBL, Pharaoh says in Exodus 3, 9, I have come down to deliver, I will bring them out, I have seen how the Egyptians are pressured, but then in the next verse, God says to Moses, come, I will send you to Pharaoh. The rhetoric moves from one agent to the other, the two being in collusion. Or in the song of Deborah, to the sound of the musicians at the watering places, this is amazing, there they repeat the triumphs of Yahweh, the triumphs of his peasantry. The double agency lets Yahweh off the hook. It's the peasants. Of course, the peasants stood no chance by themselves, so Israel attests. This holy character capable of agency is committed to dialogical existence that take Yahweh, takes Yahweh's partner with defining seriousness. The biblical term for dialogic passion is covenant. Yahweh enters into covenant variously and participates in the ongoing processes of covenant violation and covenant renewal. The result of this divine propensity is a dynamism that creates freedom, that generates dispute, and that keeps both parties at the edge of risk. It follows that the issues of common theology, power and knowledge, are only of marginal interest on the horizon of Israel. Much more central are issues of fidelity. A relational practice that does not admit of settlement that requires durable attentiveness from both parties to the relationship. It is for that reason that the defining marks of Yahweh and Yahweh's engagement are relational terms, steadfast love, 
faithfulness, justice, righteousness, compassion, the big five. Chesed, Amunah, Mishpat, Tzedakah, Racham. All these terms bespeak Yahweh's persistent commitment, but they also become the ground for quarrelsome disputes about reliable relatedness. Thus the textual interaction of covenant regularly concerns commandments and whether they have been obeyed and promises about whether they have been kept. Such a mapping of God and God's way in the world profoundly flies in the face of common assumptions about God in the ancient world and in our modern culture. So you read the atheists, they never get around to asking about fidelity that is in dispute. We may see the depth of such dialogical passion with Abraham and Moses, so Abraham engages in bargaining, and Yahweh for a time in Genesis 18 agrees to bargain. The interaction exhibits much more than a unilateral promise and much more than a singular responsibility, res- response in faith. Concerning Moses, the agreements at Sinai strike one as settled and complete, and Israel pledges obedience, except that the dramatic interaction of the golden calf entails hard bargaining and bold intervention on the part of Moses in Exodus 33. Thus, the petition of Moses, as Terry saw in his early book, evokes a change of mind on Yahweh's part. Yahweh is impinged upon by his partner. It is credible to think that these narrative accounts concerning Abraham and Moses become a model for what follows in the prophets and the Psalms. On the one hand, the prophetic utterances of the 8th and 7th centuries are characteristically speeches of judgment, wherein Yahweh establishes that the covenant has been violated and that Israel will receive due judgment. Even in this relentless stream of judgment, however, there are footnotes of dissent. Thus, petitions of Amos and the protests of Jeremiah, the exhibits of divine pathos in Hosea and Jeremiah, all attest to a hidden until brought to speech turmoil in God's inclination. The matter is not different with the 6th century prophets. Even in 2nd Isaiah, it is engagement with the tradition of complaint that was taken to be divine judgment. So Israel in the 6th century can complain of divine infidelity. My way is hidden from the Lord is Yahweh's hand short, or Israel said that Yahweh had abandoned like a mother could forget a suckling child. In each case, the complaint evokes a divine response from this God who comes as restless insistence of a divine partner. On the other hand, the Psalms with their disjunctive rhythm and hymn exhibited from Israel's side the same restless engagement with Yahweh. The emotional extremity of the laments have been almost too much for us to voice. But clearly the God who commits to covenant is not immune to the disputatiousness that is grounded in lived experience. And so what we see in the Psalter is that there is only momentary equilibrium and well-being along the way of enduring contestation. It is now current critical judgment that the Old Testament in important ways is a product of the exile when a displaced people struggled to maintain a distinctive identity in the midst of imperial domination. There was a yearning for Jewishness in Babylon. There was a yearning to return to the land. There was a passion for Yahweh among the force of Babylonian gods. So the tradition says it was an insistence upon a life of dialogic engagement in the midst of imperial monologue and thus a refusal of totalism. That relentless dialogic passion of the tradition was perhaps not so much needed when Jerusalem was safe 
But when the institutions are gone and the identity is in jeopardy, that's like our context. A strategy of cagey, ironic playfulness is required in order to define and outflank the dominant powers who seem to have no sense of humor and no capacity for dialogue. It is not surprising that the Jewish capacity for dialogue with God is generative of this textual tradition. But after we have said as much as we can about context and strategic practices, we may judge that this dialogue is not rooted in context or strategy, but in the character of God. There is enough to suggest that Yahweh's own sense of self evokes an internal dialogic life in Yahweh whose self-interest in glory and whose commitment to Israel intersect but do not always cohere. What we have explained away as critically as editing may better be the throwaway line of divine candor in a therapeutic conversation in which the speaker God tries to find a point of equilibrium in a relationship that admits of no equilibrium. The internal life of Yahweh exhibited through the imagination of Israel offers a thick, engaged life of risk and challenge and perplexity and passion and then resolve. What we have understood critically and contextually and strategically is grounded in God's own life. And if we are to attend well to this witness, we may reverse our usual critical processes to start theologically with the God who cannot resist the risks of dialogue. Yahweh no doubt remains the senior presiding member of that dialogue, but even that is placed in questions. So all of these marks of dialogic holiness, elusiveness, irascible, multi-layered, multi-voiced, capable of agency, are crucial for distinguishing Yahweh from the idols. Unlike the idols, this God is pro-life in the most profound ways intent upon sustaining the structures and juices of life capable of intervening on behalf of life in zones of recalcitrant death. More than anyone else in our field, in our generation, Terry has shown how Yahweh is the creator who sustains the life-giving processes and the orders of creation. And what I think is his signature article on Exodus and ecological disaster, he has shown the way in which Yahweh resists the power of death. That push to new life is everywhere evident in the text. In the ancestral narratives with new births, in the Exodus narrative with new freedom, in the exile, a new thing in Isaiah, a new covenant in Jeremiah, a new temple in Ezekiel, all things new for which there was no ground for newness. It is impossible to overstate the importance for the life of the world of this agent for life who opposes the power of death. Thus, in the two political pivot points of the Old Testament, this God of life subverts the force of death that is embodied in Egypt of Pharaoh and in Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar. It is more frontal in 2nd Isaiah, where in chapter 46, the poet has God mock the Babylonian idols, and in chapter 47 has God mock the empire. So the primal script for idolatry, it seems to me, is Psalm 115. The idols are silver and gold. They have mouths, 
but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. They have noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. They have feet, but do not walk. They cannot, <clears throat> they cannot <clears throat> do like that. <laughs> and then verse 8 says, if you shack up with those kinds of gods, you will become like them. You will become a couch potato. And then the psalm ends, turning from the idols to this God of life. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless those who fear. May God give you increase. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven. The word bless is Terry's word from creation. It means to infuse with the force of life. So the idols, packaged in ideologies, become icons and legitimators of the status quo systems of death. And I will say tomorrow morning that the current package of death is market ideology. This God refuses such closure. The Old Testament will not and cannot and must not go away because it is the script for this God who sustains and opens the power for life. And so this text always joins issue. It joins issue with progressive literalism, liberalism that wants to dissolve the character of God. It joins issue with vacuous spirituality that eschews tradition. It joins issue with orthodox certitude that wants to package God. It joins issue with self-congratulatory scientism. It refuses the collusion of rigid conservatism, spacey progressivism, and knowing atheism, all of which imagine that the agency for life can be in our preferred packages. This peculiar testimony is that covenantal relatedness is the alternative to totalizing claims that always end in violence. It is in contrast to othering with, with a, it is othering with attentiveness that is an antidote to all absolutisms. It is an offer of a promise that is a rescue from both despair and hebris. As this agent of dialogic holiness refuses idols, so this agent notices neighbors. And so it has occurred to me that neighbor is an appropriate antithesis to idols. Idols are those who cannot and will not participate in dialogic transactions. Neighbors are those who share in the task and the burdens and the worries and the wonders of the common enterprise. It strikes me that the inclination of Yahweh toward neighborliness is highly contested through the Old Testament because it flies in the face of cleanness and purity and control. But these creatures are invited into companionship with the creature early on. So the move toward Israel begins an active neighborliness. That move was itself toward a neighbor in need in the Exodus. And the mapping of Yahweh's life in the tradition of Deuteronomy exhibits a hard battle for neighborliness in Israel. On the one hand, I think I'm supposed to have finished by now. On the one hand, there is an insistent notice of widows and orphans and immigrants and the poor 
But of course, this is offset by a determination to purge the evil of the other Canaanites with this long list that culminates with the Amalekites. Deuteronomy is the baseline for the struggle for neighborliness. And so there is no doubt a line that runs from Deuteronomy to 3rd Isaiah where Fred Geyser in chapter 56 has found the welcoming of eunuchs and foreigners to be a decisive move away from the exclusionary mantras of the older tradition. The big move toward neighborliness is, of course, the struggle in the church to admit Gentiles. And I have no doubt that this decision is rooted eventually in the dialogic character of God, who will not be apart from the other, and who fought a battle of self-identity against great cultural odds in order to make friends of those who seem to threaten. Until finally, Paul can say, as you know, no Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. But we are not yet finished with that. Because new waves of Gentiles who, who offend keep surfacing, and the same arguments have to be made again and again. It is certain, I believe, that the idols are immune. They don't ever struggle with the question of the other. It is only this God who always has to face the other. So I imagine that this God looks into the face of the other, whether Jew or Greek, or male or female, or slave or free, or citizen or immigrant, or gay or straight, or Muslim or Hindu, or summoned to a new neighborliness so that each may be the apple of the eye. I'm almost done. <laughs> but this is all to be tested by practice. There is no doubt that the Old Testament is an act of artistic imagination. And the wonder of pastoral interpretation is that such artistic imagination is mobile. It can be transferred to new venues. Thus, the durable, compelling authority of the text is quite practical concerning the ways in which this script permits and legitimates the performance of humanness that without this script will remain unperformed. So I just made a list of the people that I know in my congregation. Here is a pair of grandparents who have watched while their tiny granddaughter has had a long series of brain surgeries. And next week she has a checkup and they'll find out how it's going. Here are two kids back from a mission trip in Honduras, and even given the naivete of senior highs, they have experienced new neighborliness, and they have an inchoate sense of vocation from what they have seen and heard. Here is a college freshman who in high school was overwhelmed with drugs and alcohol, and now he's all turned on to organic chemistry, for God's sake. <laughs> or here is a well-fixed, well-appointed older couple. He says, I'm Andy, I'm a conservative. But then a teenage granddaughter has acute diabetes and the grief creeps in. Here is a bewildered older man who is wealthy but perplexed and who asks with pathos, how long do we have to care for the poor? Here is a young woman who with her husband made preparations for the arrival of a new baby by adoption and then at the last minute the birth mother kept the baby and the would-be adoptive mother returned home to a fully furnished nursery and then just after I wrote this, the next day she got a baby. It was a different one with a roller coaster of human extremity. Here is a family where a dad died too young and left four children, and now the oldest at 14 committed suicide. There's nothing remarkable about any of that. 
It's another day in the life of the church. It's another day in the life of a pastor. It's another day in the life of the world. But a society that traffics in idols and management and explanations and orthodoxy is not adequate. Because there is wonder and love and praise. There is abandonment and the one who must be summoned back from abandonment. There is soaring ecstasy, but there is honesty that my hope is gone. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. That the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, His mercies never come to an end, great is your faithfulness. The community gathered around this text voices and knows and trusts beyond what our society can offer. Without this script, we may settle for a safe self-perception or for, for a rigidity that knows too much and judges us all. But here is a zone for full humanness made possible by this character who meets us or who refuses to meet us, who may dwell in a cloud of hiddenness or who does haunt and sometimes visit. This script gives us something to talk about after we have exhausted all of the easier data of our lives. It is the same with public issues. This dialogic holiness is tenacious for a just body politic. It is this God who continues to whisper mishpat in the ears of kings and brokers and bishops and deans who will not let us settle for our pyramids of power and money. This script, like no other knows the cries for mercy and the enigmatic ways in which holiness hears such cries and rallies to transform. So here in my congregation is a woman whose adult daughter died too soon And through her grief, she found a new way by leading a church program that hosts homeless families on a regular basis. She has not a shred of romanticism, but she has turned her grief to neighborliness as she has found new children in place of her child for whom she still grieves. So here in this same congregation is an ace in electronic communications, but he and his family, even Episcopalians, lost their home through unemployment. And this script invites to social analysis to link a lost house to predatory economics. It turns out that this holy one before Weber or Durkheim or Marx is a social analyst who can connect a lost house to the pyramids of Pharaoh or the bigger barns that are not yet completed. This text in zones of pastoral intimacy may leave us in grateful awe or in anguished dismay. This text in zones of public power may leave us enlivened for neighborliness or driven to active protest against systems of damage. In both public and pastoral zones, the realities of living and dying, of gratitude and abandonment, of possibility and oppression are given voice. They are given voice by the primal speaker of life, who then listens for responses that voice the range of lived experience. This text must not be lost because it sponsors and models and legitimates the connection between heaven and earth that keeps life bearable and viable and honest and open to newness. And where this text is lost, whether in secular buoyancy or cynicism or in frozen orthodoxy or in pious naivete, We are left only with the idols 
who do not speak or smell or hear or feel or walk or notice or care or act. And so when we read, we respond unthinkingly, thanks be to God. We slide over a hundred hermeneutical perplexities. We do so in confidence that whatever critical judgments we made, this script is a truth carrier beyond our critical capacity. It places us at risk with the need to be in dialogue with nothing short of holiness. So I imagine for the most part I have not said anything that is incongruent with Terry's work. And insofar as it may be incongruent, I repent. <laughs> in his book of 1984 on Exodus 32 and Numbers 14, Terry writes, Moses then proceeds to give God a number of reasons why consuming wrath should not be executed and thereby convince God to reverse decision. When God makes a decision, to, oh, is, when God, makes a decision God is open to change it in light of the ongoing conversation with the leadership of the community of faith. God changes in light of Moses' insistent advice. In the image of that dialogic holiness, I repent completely whenever Terry leads us to a new awareness. So I finish with good wishes for faith, an abiding gratitude and affection for Terry, who in the long term has been a most important teacher for me as for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brueggemann. You've taught us a new why the Old Testament must not go away. I know I'm not the only one to have been taking notes as uh, Dr. Brueggemann talked. His lecture will be published in a future issue of Word and World, the journal uh, here from Luther Seminary. Uh, why the Old Testament must not go away, because it witnesses to a holiness, uh, elusive, irascible, disruptive, provocative complex, the God of life. Thank you. We have some time for questions. Uh, we have two microphones here in these uh, two aisles, uh, so I would invite anyone who would like to come forward to, to speak into one of these two microphones, and uh, Dr. Brueggemann will, will respond. Don't be shy. Here comes Gwen. Can you talk about the nexus between so many Old Testament texts that are about purifying, dividing, you know, no two kinds of fabrics, no two kinds of cheese and meat have to be apart. Everything separate, 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 separate. Purity, including don't take any hostages, don't intermarry. The dialogue of all of that kind of holiness talk with, with the, what you've just been explaining about, about dialogue meaning coming together, loving the yep. other. Yep. How, how do those things, how do those two channels work in interpretation? Which, which is why I said that I think a contestation about neighborliness runs through the Bible. It's not an unequivocal testimony to neighborliness, it is an argument about neighborliness. It is an argument in which we, as the Christian congregation, have to participate. So there are many texts that want to fence out would-be neighbors by labeling them as threats. There is a book by a, 
a scholar named Beck, I think it's called Unclean, he uh, lists all the things that disgust conservatives, and then he has a shorter list of things that disgust liberals. <laughs> but he wants to argue that all these purity laws and so on grow out of what disgusts people who imagine that what disgusts me must surely disgust God. There is a book by Nor Martha Nussbaum. Uh, it's called The Clash Within. I commend it to you. It's an analysis of Hindus and Muslims in India. And Nussbaum concluded that the clash in India is not between Muslims and Hindus. It's between people who can allow the other and people who must eliminate the other. And the title of her book is to indicate she believes that all of us carry this clash in ourselves of openness and exclusion, and what counts is how we manage that clash. Now, I think that one of the implications of your question is that we have to help church people see that the Bible is essentially an ongoing interpretive dispute. We have wanted people to think that the Bible is all a seamless theological package in which everybody has agreed, but the only people who could think that are people who have never opened it. <laughs> and when I am a public persona as I am tonight, I want you to think that I practice purity of heart, which is to will one thing. But I am like you. I am a conundrum of contradictions, and what I wanted to argue is that the Bible shows that God struggles with these realities in God's own life, that we are in the image of that God. Does that make sense? Thank you. So what I think the church has to do is to surface the contest that is going on everywhere in our society, but we want to pretend that it's not going on. So you, I don't know what you had in Minnesota, but you see these church signs that say, all welcome. What they mean is, all who are like me. And, you know, that's the reality of our life. But the Bible is a script for processing that reality. That's my thesis. Dr. Bergerman, thank you so much. What about the clash within between using the language of the Old Testament and using the language of the Hebrew Bible, particularly acknowledging the larger ecumenical yeah. context? Well, I, I, I personally am persuaded by Beverly Giles that as a Christian, it's the Old Testament because it has this complex relationship with the New Testament, and we don't fool any Jew because they know what we're doing. <laughs> but but I, I, I think, I think in, in many contexts, it's much more helpful not to call it that. And I wouldn't quibble about that, but, but I, I am concerned that we at least understand uh, that, that the word old in Old Testament doesn't mean supersessionism. That, that's the huge rub. But of course, we've given people reason to think that's what it means. So uh, I, I think we have to be uh, agile and uh, use many names. Thank you. Yeah. As they did for God. <laughs> I understand that some Old Testament scholars deal with several incidents in the Old Testament as myths rather than uh, historical fact. 
as a scientist, how do I deal with myth in studying the Old Testament? Well, I think you ought to talk to Terry about that. <laughs> I, I, I don't particularly like to use the word myth because it has so many misunderstandings. I prefer to call it poetic imagination. Now, Marcus Borg, I don't think Marcus Borg goes around with Lutherans much, does he? <laughs> but, but he loves to say it's all a metaphor. The problem with that is he means mere metaphor. If he understood metaphor, he would understood that metaphor is loaded with the freight of the imagery. Uh, it's, obviously, it's obviously not scientific report. It is rather a process of ongoing interpretive imagination in which we draw on what all our mothers and fathers have said, but then when we say it, it comes out differently. And uh, if, it, if it weren't for our 19th century attempt to sound like scientists, we never would have gotten into this trap in the first place, because that's not what we have in our hands. That's what I think. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have two more folks at microphones. Why don't we make those the last two? Oh, we have Go over here. Uh, let's make, yeah, these last two questions. Okay. Your descriptive words about God's holiness reminded me of Freud in terms of haunting and uncanny feeling. And I know that you have been influenced and have drawn upon, as a conversation partner, object relations theory in some of your work. And so my question is this, what's your conversation partner now in terms of social sciences? Well, my son is a sociologist, okay. so we talk. <laughs> and uh, he, he, is, he is of a Marxist bent. He's not a communist. He's tenured. I had a, I had a uh, quote from, uh, my manuscript was much too long, so I skipped over it, but I had a famous quote from Marx in my manuscript in which he has three parallel statements. The criticism of politics is the criticism of theology. The criticism of law is the criticism of religion. And I can't remember the third one is. But, but what he meant to say is if you do social analysis, about political power, you are inevitably having a theological conversation. And I have no doubt that you work it the other way backwards every time you have a conversation about theological reality, you are bootlegging statements about uh, political economy and so on. So that's kind of the, the world. I am, I am very much uh, drawn now to what is being called post-colonial studies in which how, how do you maintain an emancipated tradition of imagination in an imperial context that wants to smother that. I think that's the situation of the church in the United States. Market ideology wants to smother everything and have us all go to NFL games and no longer think. <laughs> so, so the, the problem, so the problem for the church, the problem for the church, how do we in this kind of a culture maintain a venue for honest, imaginative speech with each other? And what every pastor knows is that because of the pressure of market ideology, there are some things you simply dare not say. So we sort of accept that. We ought to be asking, what's happening to us? Etc., etc., etc. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. 
Bless you for saying yes. So I'm actually, I'm deeply interested in the ways in which um, the Old Testament allows us to have uh, examples and language to help resist market ideology or empire in all of its forms. And uh, I'm curious, I, I know that that can be sort of a contentious conversation. Um, it certainly has been in my life. And so I'm wondering if you have any advice or tips for um, budding pastors, theologians, and scholars to enter into that conversation in a neighborly way that still bears witness to the fact that we have to resist these things. I would say be very careful. Okay. <laughs> I think, uh, I think you've got to find some reliable interpretive colleagues. And I think you've got to, I don't care what you call it, whether you call it a therapist or a spiritual director or whatever, or a mentor, you've got to have your you got to have a place where you process your fears. Because if you don't process your fears, they will devour you. They will immobilize you. And what happens to immobilized pastors is that they become cynical. And cynicism is the last thing the church needs. My and I don't live where pastors live, so I am not critical of pastors. But my sense is that many pastors could push the envelope a bit further than they do. But it is risky. My pastor last 4th of July Sunday said something about uh, the United States sometimes is really arrogant. Three people walked out. So it's, it's so hard, but it's really important to have sources of newness so that you don't forget what's been entrusted to us. Thank you.